Thank you all so much for coming today. Today will be a historic moment of our student leaders and our campus community getting a chance to really engage in a dialogue with one of our representatives. And with this historic moment, we really appreciate you all taking the time to come witness this chance of us really getting this opportunity to foster that relationship with one of our legislators. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to stage our Vice President of University Advancement, Janet Dial. Good morning, and thank you, Nia, for introducing and kicking off a great event this morning. As Nia said, I'm the Vice President for University Advancement here at Cal State LA, and it is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to this outstanding event and to introduce and welcome back to her alma mater, our distinguished guests this morning. Congresswoman Lucille Royball Allard is the eldest daughter of the late Congressman Edward Royball and Lucille Becerra Royball. She received her bachelor's degree from California State University, Los Angeles, and I will let her tell you whether she's a Diablo or a Golden Eagle. In 1992, Congresswoman Lucille Royball Allard became the first Mexican-American woman elected to Congress. As a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, the Congresswoman has worked tirelessly to create jobs, improve health services, and create stronger, better educational opportunities for her constituents in California's 40th Congressional District, and Cal State LA is in the heart of her district. She ranks as one of the House, House's foremost supporters of immigration reform, a strong homeland security system, labor unions, veterans, and the rights of women and children. Congresswoman Roy Ball Allard is the first Latina to serve on the House Appropriations Committee and the first Latina to serve as a chair or ranking member on a House Appropriations Subcommittee. As the ranking Democrat on the House Homeland Security Appropriations Subcommittee, the Congresswoman fights to ensure our Homeland Security personnel have the resources they need to keep our country safe, and she advocates for bipartisan, comprehensive immigration reform that treats immigrants humanely, focuses on deporting those who threaten national security, and better secures our borders. In addition to the Homeland Security Subcommittee, Congresswoman Roy Ball Allard serves on the Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Subcommittee. This oversees federal funding for public education, workforce training, health care initiatives, and related agencies. She also serves as a member of the newly created Joint Select Committee on Budget and Appropriations Process Reform, which will provide recommendations to improve the budget and appropriations process. Furthermore, she is a House Democratic Senior Whip, the founder and co-chair of the Women's Working Group on Immigration Reform, a founding co-chair of the Congressional Caucus on Maternity Care, and a vice chair of the Congressional Task Force on Seniors. She's also a member of the following caucuses, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, where she serves on the Health Care and Mental Health Task Force, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, the Congressional LGBT Equality Caucus, and the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Congresswoman Roy Ball Allard's accomplishments include and are highlighted by creating jobs for the 40th Congressional District and Greater Los Angeles, increasing the fairness of our immigration and protecting our homeland, and fighting for a healthier district. I wanted to highlight a couple of the projects that um, the residents of the 40th District of Greater Los Angeles have uh, appreciated. This includes the new federal courthouse for the Central District of California, building the Metro Gold Line light rail east side extension to provide safe, reliable transit, and deepening the Port of Los Angeles to increase jobs and international trade. She's also the founder of the Women's Working Group on Immigration Reform, and she is the co original co-author of the DREAM Act, which gives undocumented students a path to citizenship. And all of you know here that we have the Glazer Dreamers Resource Center here at Cal State LA. She also fought for a Department of Homeland Security directive to keep families together. This directive allows parents to maintain a relationship with their children while they are detained by immigration enforcement authorities. 
She also is a champion for fighting for a healthier district. And as former health care, health, excuse me, health task force chair for the Congressional Hispanic Con Caucus, the Congresswoman championed efforts to pass health care reform with a focus on improving the quality and affordable affordability of health care services. She has strengthened our schools and, for, and workforce here in Los Angeles, and we're grateful for all the work the Congresswoman has done. Now, if I listed all of her honors and distinctions, we would be here into, until tomorrow. So with that, I would like to introduce Congresswoman Roy Ball Allard. Please join me in welcoming her. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome ASI President Nia Johnson and ASI Vice President for External Affairs and Advancement, Veronica Garcia Martinez. Hi, good morning everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today. We really appreciate having the support, especially welcoming Congresswoman Lucille Royball today. So, without further ado, we'll go ahead and start our event. A little bit of background, we noticed that in the 2018 elections, there was this major history that was made when we saw how many women were actually elected. Apart from that, we saw that the mold was broken, thus the theme for this event, breaking the mold, women of color make history in 2018 elections. So we'll move on and we'll start with the questions. And thank you again, Congresswoman Lucille. We really appreciate you coming out okay. today. So before we start off, um, we'd like to hear a little bit more about like what you would want to share with us, such as your experiences, how, what you've learned throughout this time being um, part of Congress, and just anything else you'd like to share. Well, first of all, let me say it was really exciting to be back here at Cal State LA, and it's a very different campus. Uh, when I was here, I was part of the first freshman class. There was just a few uh, buildings uh, uh, here in um, the upper part of uh, a campus, and all the rest were bungalows. And the other thing that I find exciting is that when I was here, there was just actually just very few minorities and even fewer Latinos, uh, Latinas and Latinos who were here on campus. And at that time, quite frankly, we were not welcomed. And it was a, quite a, an experience in the early years. And to be here and to see how much more diverse the campus is and how much more inclusive is something that is really exciting for me. And it really is, is an example of just how far we have come, even though we still have a long way to go. But. And in, in terms of my, my experience uh, in, in Congress, or, or just in elected office, I grew up in a um, family in which, a political family. Uh, my father was the first Latino elected to the Los Angeles City Council in 1949. And again, it was a time when Mexican Americans African Americans, minorities in general, uh, the only time that they were accepted or allowed to go certain places, places that you all now are able to go, whether it's the hotels downtown, into certain clubs, the only way that a, a Mexican American or African American was allowed to go to these places was through the back door because they were part of the help. And when my father got elected, the white majority who controlled the city of Los Angeles at that time was not happy that a Mexican, as they would say, was elected to the Los Angeles City Council. And as a result of that, we experienced firsthand the discrimination against our community and against the minority community in general at Los Angeles at that time. We had safe houses going to school, to grammar school, because of threats on my father's <coughs> life, uh, threats about us being uh, kidnapped. We used to have our wires tapped. When my father was fighting police brutality, uh, the police would tap our wires, 
And when we would uh, make arrangements to go out with, with friends, we used to have to do it at school. And then when we were ready to go, and because in those days we had streetcars, uh, we would pick up the phone and you could hear the little click. In those days when your wires were being tapped, you could hear the click. And we would just simply say, okay, we're ready uh, to go, we'll meet you at the prearranged uh, place, whether it was to go to a movie or you know, out to, to dinner or whatever. And so those experiences, like the experiences that you are all uh, having now, help to shape you and to, to give you a first-hand experience of the challenges that are faced by young people, particularly those who live in underserved communities, those who are from a minority communities, and including the, the uh, white Anglo community of, that live in poor communities. They, they experience, in many ways, the same struggles in terms of being able to give opportunities to their children as well. And one of the things that I've learned since I've been in public office, and actually through the examples of, of in growing up, is that in order for us to be successful, that we have to appreciate the diversity that we have, and that we have to see each other not as enemies, not as well if this community gets something, then it takes away from the other. But we need to see each other as allies. Because as we work together towards our common goals, it is our strength in pulling together as allies, working towards our common goals that are going to help us to be successful. Thank you for that. And as a follow-up question, and also um, as a note, I really resonated with how you stressed the importance of how your identity can impact your experience within politics. And really expanding on that, I know that myself as a black woman, I've noticed that my identity has allowed me to represent my communities and different communities um, in a really unique way tailored to the intersectionality that I hold. I'm hoping that if you can share how has identity impacted positively or negatively your work within policy and advocacy? I think like with all of us, my ad identity as a woman, as a Latina, as a mother, as a grandmother, and the experiences that I had uh, as a child really have directed me towards the kinds of policies and the kind of work that I do. And it also has given me a tremendous uh, appreciation for the, the struggles that young people have. Because even though, as I mentioned earlier, my father was an elected uh, official, he nevertheless experienced the discrimination that others experienced. That didn't shield him from that. Even when he was in Congress, the discrimination against my mother as a Latina and uh, my father still existed. So having experienced all of that and seeing all of that has made me even more determined to address those inequities. That is why in 2001, when I learned about the Dreamers, I, did, I was not aware of it, quite frankly. And it was one, a young lady who was working for me, who um, talked to me about a friend of hers, she was from Texas, who he, she had just gotten off the phone and this young woman was in tears because she was not able to get a job. She wasn't able to take advantage of other opportunities and she didn't know what she was gonna be able to do. And so having learned about that, I told uh, my staff person, why don't you look into it and to see you know, if there's something that we can do uh, legislatively. And I thought it was a no-brainer, right? I mean, these were young children brought to this country no fault of you know, their own. They knew, for the most part, most don't know any other country. And I thought it was gonna be just a simple thing, just make my colleagues aware of it, and we would be able to take care of it. That was 2001. We're in 2019, and we're still fighting that battle. But this time, we're gonna win. I think with 
with that being said, you pinpointed that it used to be a different culture between back then, seeing how it was mainly, well, white people, white males who were in these leadership roles, and now we're seeing a more diverse population that's being represented. Um, with that, I'd like to ask, how do you think we can better understand and engage with the diverse perspective, and how we can use that to advance on our advocacy efforts? I think it's very important that we go into whatever, whether it's you know, advocacy or you're, you're, you're dealing in a, a public policy arena, is that in order to be effective, you have to listen to others. You have to listen to the opposition. You have to understand where other people are coming from because we've all had different experiences. And particularly in Congress, you have 435 members of Congress from Mississippi, from Alabama, from uh, Nevada, Texas, uh, Missouri, Minnesota. I have no clue what it was like to grow up in those states or to be a, a part of those states. And quite frankly, their focus is not helping Californians, it's helping Mississippi and Alabama. So it's important to understand where they're coming from, where, what their goals are, and in the end, you know what you find out? That their goals and what they want for their communities, what they want for their state, is really no different than anybody else. Because no matter who you are, no matter what your backgrounds are, your experiences, we want good education for our children. We want a healthy, clean community. We want opportunities for a better quality of life for our children, for our, our, our parents, to be able to achieve the American dream. So the key is listening and understanding what those differences are. And again, recognizing what I said earlier, whether you're white, black, brown, yellow, purple, or, or green, we are not enemies. Whether you, women are not the enemy of, our, of, of the men, and vice versa. <laughs> And much of what we've accomplished in our history is because of the support from the white Anglo communities who helped us, who became our allies, and helped us to achieve some of the things that we have. Whether you're talking about the Civil Rights Act, whether you're talking about the uh, uh, 19th Amendment where women got uh, the vote, this happened because of those relationships, of those a different diverse groups coming together, our male uh, counterparts as being allies and helping us to achieve those goals. So that, I think that's one of the key things is to recognize the fact that we are much stronger and much better when we work together, when we have mutual respect for each other. Because even when we don't agree, it's important to have respect for the opinions of others. And, and understand where they're coming from. And when you do that, when you feel respected and you understand that you have common goals and that you are trying to achieve those goals in a way that, that meets the concerns as much as possible, meets the concerns of the diverse communities, then we can see real positive change. Not easy to do. It is not easy to do. That's true. I would definitely really want to expand on how we understand that that's much easier said than done. Right. And really recognizing that there at times is this persona that we see in politics, that for so long politics has been dominated by typically um, white men. And to have so many women of color now step into that space, do you feel like you've ever at times had to conform to the way white men maneuver politics? Or have you been able to, at what point did you see that you broke that mold and were just able to maneuver that space as a woman of color and really stand within your own skin? Mm -hmm. If you're asking if, if I or, or other women uh, that, that uh, are my colleagues feel that they have to be more like men in order to achieve something, that has not been my experience. 
the women, I, I actually came in in uh, the year of the woman also. It was not as large a group as uh, you know, this, this time around, but it also was part of the group that was known as the year of the woman. And, and quite frankly, the women that have come in and, and my experiences with my colleagues, they come in with their own strengths and their own knowledge and their own experiences. And they're not afraid in any way to fight for those things. For example, when I was elected, and it was, again, the year of the woman, our male counterparts did not know how to handle us at all. <laughs> they, you know, we would be in an elevator to go vote, and they would be talking about among themselves, well, what's the vote? You know, what do you think, we, uh, what are you gonna do, so on and so forth. We would get into the elevator, and literally there would be dead silence. And some of my colleagues, it didn't happen to me, but some of my colleagues were actually stopped as they were trying to enter the uh, chamber to vote and told, you know, staff can't enter, you have to you know, wait outside. And they had to say, well, no, I'm a member of Congress. And, and even the leadership at that time, when they were putting together task forces on, on childcare or other uh, important issues, we would be left out. And so the women got together and we marched to the speaker's office and demanded that we be included, that we no longer be excluded from whatever was happening. Because we kept reminding them, we got elected the same as you did, and our vote counts the same as yours. And that gradually started to change. They don't stop us at the door. Now they do ask us, hey, how are you gonna vote on this or what your opinion is? But, th but the fact is that women still have to work harder to be taken seriously. We get criticized more easily. They still talk about, and I'll give a perfect example, is Nancy Pelosi. I can honestly tell you there is no one who is brighter and better prepared to be speaker than Nancy Pelosi. She could not achieve the things that we have achieved. We would not have, had she not been the leader at the time, we would not have Obamacare. I can honestly tell you that. A lot of things would not have passed had it not been for her and her ability to, be, to do what I said earlier, to build coalitions, to bring people together from differing parts of the country, to focus on the objective and find ways to pass legislation, which is never perfect, if anybody wants legislation that's gonna be perfect and you're in elected office, you'll never vote for a thing because there is no such thing as a perfect legislation. But what do they talk about? They call her a bitch. Why? Because she is strong. If she were a man, they'd be saying, my God, that, you know, what a strong speaker. He's really able to bring people together but, but because it's Nancy, and what do they talk about? How she looks, what she's wearing, you know, uh, the, the uh, I can't remember what it was she just did uh, recently when there was a response to, I think it was one of the president's uh, speeches. Did they talk about what she said? No, they talked about how she looked. Mm -hmm. And so from that perspective, we still have a ways to go so that we are taken more seriously. And women do have to work harder to get that same recognition, even today. It's getting easier, uh, but the fact is, I, I, I believe that that's true no matter what your profession is. And, and another example of why women still need to be taken seriously, what are the professions that are mostly ignored and, and not held in the highest esteem? because traditionally they're held by women. Teaching, mm -hmm. nursing, mm -hmm. they, they're not seen as you know, a doctor mm -hmm. is, and why? And it's because they are professions that traditionally have been filled by women. And that in itself has to change because there is no greater 
profession than being a teacher. A teacher is someone where, you know, your child starts at, at uh, preschool even. Mm -hmm. And that is some of the most formative and most important years of a child's life. That's where they gain their self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And yet, that profession is not something that is held in high esteem, underpaid and so on and so forth. And the same is true as nursing. If, if you have been in any uh, hospital or a, a medical you know, situation, you see the doctor once in a while, but who's really taking care of you? It's the nurse. So that's just an example of, of why women still have a long way to go to gain the same respect that men, men have today. I think it's really interesting how you touched base on a lot of different points. Um, but something that I do want to go back to is how you mentioned that you were part of two waves of seeing women come into Congress. So looking at that and seeing how the first wave, the reaction to that, and then now in 2018, the reaction to that, would you say that there's a difference between the two? And if so, what do you think would be the major difference? And I'm thinking about like tying this really back to breaking the mold because you're also talking about how there's still room for improvement. And so that leads me to believe, well, would we even consider that we have officially broken the mold? I would say no. I think there's big cracks in the mold, mm -hmm. but I don't think that it has been broken. And uh, so we still have a lot of, of work ahead of us. And as we get more women into key positions of power, whether it's in the political arena, corporate America, in administrative positions, uh, in education, and in, you know, health, in the field of health, uh, little by little, the cracks mm -hmm. will eventually break the mold. I just don't believe that we're there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And with the change of the political climate and how this society has evolved with your term in Congress, do you think that your leadership role and priorities had to change depending on the Congress? And if so, how did you essentially find yourself work, working through that? My priorities did not change. The overall priorities did not change, whether it was Republicans or Democrats in control of the House. Uh, my focus, for example, I mentioned the DREAM Act 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, the disparities in health care, eliminating those have always been something that I have been focused on. I had, uh, there's several bills, uh, one was the STOP Act that was to educate parents about the dangers of underage drinking and provide grants for our community. That took me, that one took, uh, STOP Act took me 12 years. A newborn screening when I, I found out that particularly in, in disadvantaged communities that hospitals were not giving the full range of, of tests to newborn babies and as a result babies were, were growing up unnecessarily uh, with diseases and disabilities that could have been prevented or minimized had they gotten the right screening. That took me eight years. So, so my, my goals and my prior, uh, priorities, comprehensive immigration reform was something that, again, that from the very time I, I began, I was elected to Congress has been a focus. Still, still working on that with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. But, but depending on wh whether Democrats or Republicans were in power, it's uh, prioritizing those goals would change where you, you, would, you would look to see, okay, do I have a better chance now at passing the DREAM Act, like mm -hmm. now? We do have a good chance of passing the DREAM Act in the House. The problem is gonna be when it's in the Senate. So to answer your question, my priorities in terms of what my goals were, what I wanted to accomplish uh, in Congress, didn't change with who was in power, but how I prioritized those issues sometime did change. Um, based off of that, do you think that you've been able to learn how to prioritize and strategically see well, what can I prioritize um, this year based on like um, maybe some challenges that you've faced or maybe out of experiences with failure that you might 
have gone through? Or was that something that you already went in um, being elected, like knowing about this? No, you, you, you never know until you're in elected office. Being in an elected office is an entirely different experience. And many times, particularly younger people, uh, are elected and think they're going to be go in and be able to change the world. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that it's impossible because only, I guess, if you were king or queen could you do that you have to get 218 votes out of the House mm -hmm. to pass anything. You have to get at least 51 or 60 votes in the Senate, and then you have to have a president that is willing mm -hmm. to, to sign a bill. So one of the things that is, is really important as an elected of official, and even as someone who's an advocate, is to understand that in the political arena itself, that it really is the relationships that you form with both parties. You, as individuals, you work to find common ground. And that politics truly is the art of compromise. And I'll just use the DREAM Act as a perfect example. I worked with all the advocacy groups, uh, worked and talked with DREAMers, worked with all the, the, the stakeholders in putting together the DREAM Act. And, and it's probably the most, well it is, the most progressive DREAM Act bill that has ever been written. I've already gotten a call from the Senate <coughs> saying, if I could vote for this bill, absolutely I will, I would. But it will never pass the Senate. So that says, that as good as this bill is, path to citizenship, it allows dreamers who have, uh, that were deported to be able to, to apply and, and to come back home. It uh, allows for uh, dreamers to be able to access uh, uh, student financial aid. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a whole series of very positive things. And so the, the difficulty for me is going to be is in order to get the bill passed, mm -hmm. what is it that I'm going to be willing to give? Mm -hmm. There are certain things that I would never get. For example, path to citizenship. Let me just use that one example. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is something that would never compromise on that. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be some other things that are going to be difficult. To, to compromise on. I don't know what those things are, but uh, it's not going to be easy. And in the end, like with every piece of legislation, you have to decide, is there more good in the bill than bad? And because of the bad, is it worth losing the good? And that's something constant that, that a, uh, an elected official has to weigh all the time, the good and the bad in legislation. And is it worth giving everything up because it's not good enough? And my hope is that we have some strong support in the Senate, that the, my colleagues in the Senate who support the DREAM Act as it stands will be able to convince the Senate, at, at, at least enough senators, so that the, any changes to our bill at our, at our minimum. And that's something that we can say, okay, g you give us citizen, uh, citizenship and we'll give up, I, I don't know what, it's hard for Ian to use an example because I don't want to give anything up. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, then, and then maybe once the bill passes, then there's always the possibility to build and add things to it. Not easy again, but there's always that possibility. So that, that's probably one of the most difficult things about being in uh, an elected position is because you always want the best, and yet you know that it's, it's not a reality. 
I find that very interesting that you shared your experience as a legislator with trying to craft this bill that will really support um, our DACA recipients, our Dreamer students. And Cal State LA is the CSU that has the highest population of DACA recipients. So I know- My 40th district has the highest in the nation. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I know this community absolutely appreciates everything you're doing. And that's something that student leaders here have advocated for in various spaces. Another thing that student leaders have also advocated for is the Me Too movement and with women's marches. And it'd be interesting to know, does that advocacy and those marches, those movements, do they impact the legislation and policy that happens in your domain? Oh, absolutely. Could you share Absolutely. That? Advocacy is absolutely critical. And, and these social uh, movements are absolutely critical. Because what they do is, they bring attention to policymakers about the inequities, about the injustices that exist. Many times we don't know because we may not have be, be experiencing certain things. Like I didn't know about dreamers until it was brought to my attention. And so some of the, the best things that have happened in this country, like I mentioned, the, the Civil Rights Act, the uh, 19th uh, passage of the 19th Amendment for women, giving women the right to vote. These were all advocacy uh, you know, uh, movements that would not have happened had it not been for the advocacy and, and, and the, the movements that brought attention and put pressure on elected officials to address these issues. So it's absolute, they're absolutely critical. And the reason that we have gained so much more support for DREAMers, and why I know that even the senators who are saying, well, I don't know if we can support that bill, are gonna be made very uncomfortable, is gonna be because of the advocacy groups. The DREAMers who came to Washington, who put a human face on, what, who are the DREAMers? Absolutely made a difference. And I'm gonna just give you one, a quick example. I, I don't remember which year the, the dream, um, my dream uh, act was uh, up on the floor. And I was lobbying my Democratic colleagues. And there was one colleague who was from, wasn't from Mississippi, it was one of the southern states. And he said, look Lucille, he says, I, I'd like to help you, but there is no way that I can support dreamers. These, they, they're illegal, they came to this country. I would lose my election if I supported this bill. So, you know, I gave my reasons why I thought he, he should and, and respected the fact that he had to represent his district. So the day of the vote, I'm, I'm looking, we're, we're counting the votes to see who's, you know, supporting it. There is, it's um, on, on the wall, all um, the names of members of Congress, and as you vote, the lights go on. It's red if it's a no. Um, green if you voted yes, and yellow if you just vote present. So I'm monitoring to see who's voting, and I see his name, uh, and he votes yes. I, and I was shocked. And so after I went and uh, I told him, what happened? You told me that you would risk your election if you voted for the DREAM Act. And he says, you know, he says, what happened? He says, I happened to be in my office when a dreamer came by, not even from his state. And I had some time and I sat and I talked with her. He says, and after hearing her story and what her aspirations were and what, you know, uh, what the opportunities that were being denied her, he says, I could not vote against her. He says, I, I kept seeing her face and I could not vote against her. So yes, advocacy, is absolutely critical in helping us to achieve, you know, positive policies, things that that um, help to improve the quality of life of our communities and uh, Americans as a whole. Looking at sort of the sacrifices or the risks that people in legislature or in these leadership roles they have to go through, and just I think there's this. Um, when you actually hear the stories from students and from the, the people that you're gonna be voting these bills on for, 
what advice can you give those people, or in specifically right now, students, to empower them to actually go and share their stories? To empower them, I, th I think a lot of you are doing a real good job right now. <laughs> But I, I think that in, in terms of, of being really effective, I, you have to understand the two roles of the role of advocates, which we just talked about, and also the role and the limitations that policymakers have. Advocates, you could push us, you keep pushing us and pushing us so that we can have. Um, the, the information and, and that push we need to keep fighting to get the very best that we can. Advocates want the perfect. Your uh, elected officials, no matter how hard we fight and how much we get, we know that we're never gonna get the perfect. And so th there's, there's sometimes tension between the advocates and the policy makers mm -hmm. who want the perfect and no matter how hard we try, we, we can't achieve it. And so I think it's, it, it's important, to, number one, to understand those differences. And also, I, I think one thing that sometimes advocates have to be careful of is not to push and demand for things that are absolutely impossible to achieve. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here because I wanna give you an example. And the reason I'm gonna give this example is because when adequacy groups go beyond uh, the possible, and, and I don't mean, when I say beyond the possible, I'm not talking about, well, the, you know, the Republics are in control and they won't support it, uh, or the Democrats are in control, they won't support it. I mean something that really is impossible. And I, like I said, I'm gonna go out on a limb because I, I because when that happens, then groups lose credibility. Okay, here I go. This whole advocacy about eliminating ICE. Let's talk about that. Is it ICE, number one, or is it the policy of this president that is telling ICE, this is what you have to do. It's the policy that is creating the horrors that are happening in our community, where parents are being rounded up when they, you know, they're, they're dropping their kids at school. So the focus should be on the policy and who is creating that policy that is telling this agency, this is what you have to do. Number two, if ICE were to be eliminated, we had a magic wand and eliminated, it would have to be created with a different name. And why? Because the dealing with immigrants is just one very small portion of what ICE does. And they're following the policy. Mm -hmm. Their other roles are, they deal with child pornography, child trafficking, human trafficking, cyber security, all these other things that they have responsibility for. You can't eliminate them. They would, it would just be created with a different name. So we ha have to focus where the real cause is, and that is we have to fight and pressure to change the policy now, what is, is inexcusable, and it is not part of policy, and which we, we as members of Congress and I as, as chair of, of the Subcommittee on Appropriations of, of Homeland Security um, have been fighting for and have put language in there for more transparency, for more accountability, you know, those kinds of things, is what is not part of policy and I have said this to, to them, both Border Patrol and ICE, is how they treat immigrants, the people that they round out. That is not part of policy. Mm -hmm. How they disrespect them, that is not part of policy. And that is something that we can directly go at 
and, and, and stop that from happening. And because I'm on the appropriations, I have what they call the power of the purse. And there are things that I can do to make them more transparent and to be more res respectful and have been able to do that to some, to some extent. But so we have, we have to be careful about what we ask for. The, the target should be the policy and the person who created that policy, not the individuals <coughs> who are carrying it out, but how they carry it out, yes. That's where we go after that. And that's why, again, advocates, those who represent the immigrants who have, who, and I've gone to Texas, I've gone you know, to the border and seen things for myself. I've seen children and families in cages. That is not acceptable. That is not acceptable. And so we're fighting that. And in this last bill, I, I put in several uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars so that they, to eliminate the overcrowding, so that they would have showers, so that they would have not rotten food, but you know, food and, and medical care. So there's certain things that can be done, but nothing is going to change the way it should be until the policy itself changes. And that's where the target should be. And that's where the public has tremendous power. Advocacy is important, but unless those who are advocating are also politically involved, unless they are voters who go out and vote on election day, you don't accomplish that much. That, that pressure is not as strong as it should be. For those of us who, who listen and, 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 and respect the advocates, who bring these things to us, yes, of course, it's important to us. But to reach certain individuals who have policies that are hurting our community, unless you're going to hurt them in terms of their next election, they can ignore us. They can ignore us. Because like, in, like anybody else, the one thing that politicians are very much aware of is, just like any individual, they want to keep their job. And how do you keep your job? By pleasing your bosses. By following you know, the rules of your business, of your school, or whatever. Elected officials are no different. But who are our bosses? Our bosses are all of you, are our voters, are our community. And if we don't respect our community and, and they know that we are fighting for them, they can easily fire us. And how do they fire us? By voting for the other person coming the next election. So we're very much aware of that. So any of our successes, the DREAM Act or any other pieces of legislation, they're going to be won because of the pressures from the outside, not from within Congress itself. But voting is absolutely critical. You know, this idea that well, you know, why bother voting? Politicians, they don't care uh, you know, about us. It's only about the money and so on and so forth. You want to know something? Our enemies want us to believe that. They want us to believe that we are helpless and that there's nothing that we can do to change things. Because as long as our community under believes that and thinks that there's nothing they can do so they don't bother voting, then are and also enemy, those who don't support us, can go about their business and do what they want without any consequences. So they, they, they feed that into our communities. And then in, in our communities, another thing that's really important, and, and I think it's an important role that all of you can play as young people, as students, as, as advocates, is helping our community to understand the power that they have and what the connection is between the policies that people like me make 3,000 miles away and how it impacts their everyday lives. Because there is nothing in anybody's life that isn't directly impacted by the decisions that are made by politicians. How much money goes for education? How much money is going to go to, to transportation? 
How much money is going to go to health care? What are going to be the rules of, of, of health care, community clinics? Anything that you can mention, those decisions are made by politicians. And politicians need to be held accountable. And the way they're held accountable is that they know that in their district, or if they want to run for president, you know, in the, in their na in the nation, mm -hmm. that they listen to what the voters are saying because they want to be hired and they also know they can be fired by the voters. So that I think is something that's extremely important for young people to understand because who are, who's among the lowest voters? College students. And so why is it that some of the first things that uh, are cut and that we fight for every single year, Pell Grants, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, student loans, why are they targets? Because you all aren't holding them accountable. They know they can make those cuts and they're not going to pay a price because students don't vote. And I could name several uh, you know, other, other things. If students were to vote, believe me, just like seniors, the last thing we want to do is, although there have been some movements, but the last thing you want to do is mess with their Medicare or their Social Security, because they do vote. So that's why students are easy targets. You all start voting, we're not going to be getting cuts to programs that are important to all of you. And one final question, if I may, before we wrap up. Um, I'm really excited that you touched on the aspect of what young voters, what the role it is that we play when it comes to really putting that pressure on our legislators. Is there any advice you can give to some of the young voters that do get engaged in advocacy, but at times they get frustrated with um, just how slow bureaucracy can move and not really understanding the different parts of the political climate, what advice can you give to them so that they don't give up when they get frustrated? Focus on your goal. For example, I go back to the DREAM Act. It's been frustrating since 2001 to be at 2019 and still not have a DREAM Act. But if that goal is worthy and you believe in it, then keep fighting for it. But it's also important to know, and I mentioned that, that politics is the art of compromise. But in that compromise, it's also important to know that you don't need to sacrifice your values and your beliefs in order to get something done. And that is something that, as, whether you're an elected official or when you're out in the world, you're working for corporate, uh, you know, the corporate world or whatever profession you happen to be, I think that it's important before you're in that situation when all these pressures are coming at you, whether it's to lose your election if you vote a certain way, or you'll lose your job if you don't support a policy in, in you know, whatever business or school that you're at, that it's really important for a person to be very, very clear as to what their values are and what that line is that you will never cross, regardless of what the consequences are. Because once you're under the pressures of you've got to do this or you've got to do that or you'll lose the election or if you don't support your boss, you're, you're, you're going to lose your job or so on and so forth, it's very, very hard then to, to try and decide what you're going to do. And, but if you have, without the pressure, have are clear about your values, are clear about that line that you will never cross, that when you have these pressures coming at you, you have something to measure it against, to know whether or not, okay, if I do this, am I crossing that line? And, and I, I can't stress that enough because no matter what your profession, no matter what you do in life, you are always going to be faced with those kinds of pressures that are going to put you in a situation of what you're not sure what to do because it could mean 
your livelihood. It could mean all different kinds of things to you personally or to your family. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be very, very clear about who you are, what your values are, and where you're willing to compromise and where you're not. With that being said, we are going to be wrapping up pretty soon. But before we do, I know we did want to take questions from the audience. Yes, so we actually passed out some index cards where you could actually write down some of your questions. And so Jasmine has actually been collecting them for us. And she has chosen about three. And we're going to go ahead and read those out loud for Congresswoman. So thank you. Okay. So these are the last couple of questions I saw. <laughs> OK. So, Somebody asked, black women are often said to be the backbone of the Democratic Party in terms of volunteering, voting, loyalty, etc. Yet, it doesn't seem to be taken seriously as a voting bloc or national candidates. What do you think can help the Democratic Party embrace black women's loyalty to the party? Embrace black women's loyalty to the party. Well. First of all, I, I, I do want to say that there, the Black uh, Congressional Black Caucus is a very powerful uh, caucus, mm -hmm. and that there are many, many women who are part of that caucus, who have tremendous talent, who are very effective. Uh, locally, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Karen Bass. She was the speaker. Let me tell you, she is a dynamo. And so, in, in terms, and I'm, I'm, trying, I'm not sure I quite oh, understand yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the question, uh, black women's loyalty to the party. I, I think what, what happens sometimes, because as I mentioned earlier, politics is the art of compromise, that there, there is the, the frustration that you talked about when folks want a lot to be accomplished and not understanding mm -hmm. what the limitations are and, and respecting or even knowing that the battle is going on. Because for example, immigration, comprehensive immigration reform, since the time I was there, that has been the one, number one issue that the Hispanic Caucus has fought for. And, and the Black Caucus have been allies with us because they, they too have issues with immigration, folks from Haiti and other places, the Asian Pacific. And that is a fight that we have every single day. And yet, when I come back home, people say to me, why aren't you doing something about it? You know, we're not hearing anything. Well, there's two reasons for that. One is we're 3,000 miles away. And a lot of what happens, even when we have press conference, never gets um, back here. And, and secondly, quite frankly, with a lot of things that are done with the Black Caucus and, and others, is we do behind the scenes. We purposely are working behind the scenes to accomplish things because we don't want those who oppose us to know what it is that we're doing until we feel that we're in a strong enough position. So in some cases, I think it is the frustration that not enough is being done. There's also the, the, the prejudice, and I'm being a little bit more general than, than uh, what the question is. There's also that feeling among uh, those in our community that if, if I'm talking to Latinos, it's the African Americans are getting everything and they're taking it from us. They're getting all the attention. I get the, you know, something similar. If, if, um, I'm, I'm, if, if I'm talking to someone in the black community, it's the Latinos that are getting all the attention. And so again, we need to start talking to each other and, and seeing each other as allies so that we, we will have that power. But the, but the reason I think we lose the black vote is because of what you said earlier, the fact that it takes time to achieve goals and that people aren't always aware of the goals that we are fighting for. Mm -hmm. And that they get discouraged and they say, why, why bother? The Democrats, 
you know, aren't helping, in, in this case, the African American community the way they should. So maybe, let's try maybe the Republican uh, Party. But if, if you look at the policies and how people vote, not what people say, but how they vote, you'll find a very different story. A very different story. I have been on the floor and I have heard my Republican colleagues get up there and give speeches about our veterans and so on and so forth and their patriotism, so on and so forth. And then the vote comes and they vote against veteran housing. They vote against you know, health care for veterans. So don't pay attention to necessarily what people say. Listen to them, but then look to see how are they voting? What are they actually doing um, for it? And I think that sometimes there is the frustration and the misunderstanding and the feeling that uh, the caucus, I guess in this case maybe the black caucus isn't doing enough for um, African Americans. But I, I can tell you, they fight every day in support of the African American community. And they work with us, the Hispanic caucus, the, with the Tri Caucus, which is a Hispanic caucus, the Black caucus, and the Asian Pacific Islander caucus. We work together because we understand you know, that our strength is, is together to support the issues that are important. I don't know if that answered uh, that person's question or not, but I think a part of it is not understanding and not knowing what's actually happening especially behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Okay. This next question says, given your experience in public service, what advice would you give to new members uh, in Congress in order to impact their communities? New members of Congress. I, a lot depends on the experiences um, the political experience that someone has before you get to Congress. Mm -hmm. Even as a state legislator, you know, you experience the, the, the workings of the state legislature. I was there for six years. You get to Congress, it is an entirely different world. And it takes a huge adjustment. So being in an elected office is in, in, in the local and state government is a good training ground for learning how to create alliances, how to learn and to focus on issues. But when you get to Congress, it's extremely different because you're not just there representing your, your, your district and working. Like when I was in the state legislature, it was all about California. It was mainly Northern California versus uh, Southern California. But, you know, eventually it was still about California. In, in Washington, it's 435 members of the House and 100 members in the Senate from different parts of the country who could care less about California or whatever state you happen you know, to be in. So, so, so when you get to Congress, my advice would be is to learn the process, it's a very different process, to get to know your colleagues, to, to uh, create alliances, and, and find out who, who is it that supports the policies that you care about, whether it's immigration or healthcare or education, and, and join those caucuses and, and, and then you know, uh, move forward. With the understanding, again, the hardest part for, for any of us, and particularly newcomers, who think that they're going to be able to change things right away, is to realize that there is nothing that's perfect that comes out of legislation. And that's a hard one, particularly if they come in as advocates. Uh, it, and it's hard then to, as an advocate who's been pushing for the perfect, to all of a sudden be in a position where you're going to have to give up some of that, that perfect in order to get something done. And so, but, but those alliances are absolutely critical in being able to, to get anything done. And our last question is from Irene. And they said, I hear people talk about the right time for a female president of USA. 
when is your opinion of when the right time is? And do you support, say, of the correct women candidate for president in 2020? So do you have some? I think it's past the time. (laughs) (laughs) We should already have a woman president. Um, Again, it's what we talked about earlier. I think one of the, the issues is that when it comes to women in leadership positions, that we are not seen in the same way as our male counterparts. We're not seen as strong as uh, our male counterparts. And so we have to overcome the perception of women being weaker, not as um, well prepared, not tough enough. And then when we are tough enough, I mentioned Nancy Pelosi, then you're a bitch and you're, you know, all these other things. So that, that is something that is still very, very um, true today. But it, the value of having women in, in politics, and one of the things that women have proven, that not only are we able and capable, but in many, many times, we are much better prepared and able than our male counterparts. And, and when it comes to women being in uh, positions of power in public office, women bring a very special perspective to the policy making table. We bring our experiences as daughters, as mothers, as sisters, um, as you know, uh, members of our community, something that our male counterparts do not have, uh, experiences that they don't have. And as we're making policy, it is incredible, critical that those perspectives and that experience is, is part of the discussion when we're creating policy, if that policy is truly to be effective and to beat the needs of our community. Now more than ever, women are, what, 51% or more of the, of the population? And yet, when you look at the percentage of of Congress, and Congress as a whole, women are only 22%. So what has happened, though, as more and more women are being elected, that we are able to bring those experiences. And, And a lot of what, when we were dealing with Obamacare, a lot of things that were put into that bill that helped our community, community clinics, some of the things that were there that are, are helping children and families as a whole were ideas that came from the women of Congress and we put them in. And in some cases, some of our male counterparts said to us, you know what, we didn't even think about that because it's, it's my wife who takes our kids to you know, the doctor, to the clinic, or who deals with these, with these issues. We hadn't even thought about that. And so women play a absolutely critical role in the policy making uh, process and even though we have to work harder to to be seen in in the same way as our our male counterparts to have the credibility we are little by little that is changing that is changing and we need to have more women in politics and that is one of the things that I hope that more and more maybe some of you right here in the audience someday will be sitting here and saying oh my god I used to come to Cal State LA and I never dreamt I'd be sitting here mm-hmm. as a member of Congress talking to all of you. But, but, but it isn't just in, pol- in, in politics where you can make a difference. In your individual professions, with women as you gain uh, in, in, in positions of power, whether it's in corporate America, as, as an administrator and teacher, don't forget to, to, to mentor and help other women come up as well. And unfortunately, the, the reality is that we are judged more harshly. And remember that you are, as you succeed, you are an example of what women can do. And you know what? We're all, making, we're all gonna make mistakes. That's true of our males, counterparts, and women's counterparts. And learn from those mistakes. Learn from those challenges. Don't let them defeat you. Use them as learning experiences 
And, and through those defeats that you mentioned earlier, by, by learning from them, then it just makes you stronger. And, and I, can I just end with in one more? I know this was the last question, but this is something that I want to say to all of you. And, and I don't know what, uh, everybody has a different situation. But many times I run into to young people who, um, for whatever reason, because of the challenges and obstacles and, that they have sometimes in their life, they drop out of school. They don't finish their education. And when I talk to them, they'll say, well, you know what, I, I have to work. I can only take maybe one course or two courses because I can't afford more, I don't have the time. And so, you know, I, I'm just dropping out and, and I'm getting a job. And because by the time I graduate, you know, I'll be 30, 40, and I know that seems real old to a lot of you, believe me, it's not. <laughs> 30, 40, even, you know, 50, whatever, whatever the age is. But if you think of it in, the, in these terms, that God willing, each one of you someday will be 30, 40, 50, 60, that don't you want to celebrate that birthday someday saying, my God, I'm so glad today I'm the teacher, the, the doctor, wh whatever your aspiration is, I'm so glad. Then on that, say, 50th birthday, to look back and say, oh my God, if only I had stuck with it. Don't give up your dream. Don't give up your goals. No matter how long it takes, you can't, you can't, can't achieve them, no matter what the obstacles are. Keep fighting. Wow, so with that being said, and again, can we just give a round of applause to our congressman? So thank you all for coming today. We also want to invite you all to a reception that we'll be having outside. And at that time, you will be more than welcome to also take pictures in the lobby. And again, we just really appreciate you all coming to this special event. Um, as some final reminders, we do have our ASI student leader elections taking place right now. So if you want to get a chance to get to know some of your potential next year student leaders, this is the time. So we will be having events throughout the rest of this month. And we also have some other events coming up, such as next month we'll be hosting a special conference meeting with the 22 other student CSU student leaders that will be coming together to discuss issues pertaining to all CSU students. So I hope you all enjoy today's event. And at this time, you are free to step outside and enjoy our reception. Mm -hmm.